You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Tempo of Film. I'm Steve. And I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the trailers, box art, and behind the scenes. And this week we're starting our our very Busey Christmas. Yay! Very Busey with Gary Busey this time. We are watching 1993's Surviving the Game. <sighs> Why would you want to kill yourself? Maybe I like the idea of choosing when I die instead of having somebody else choose for me. If someone offered you a good job, would you be interested? What kind of job are you talking about? We need someone to help us with our hunts out in the wilderness. Are you sure about this one? Oh, I'm sure. Has he got courage? Gentlemen, I would like you to meet our new hunting guide, Mason. Here's a toast to the hunters and a prayer for the hunted. <laughs> <laughs> the hunt begins... We're not really gonna hunt him, are we? He's nothing. He's less than nothing. You're mine, Mason! I won't take any part in this. I want you! Thank you. If you make it to civilization, you live. Thank If you don't, ah! maybe God will have mercy. No! Yeah! I think he's gone back to the cabin. No, no. Has ever done that before. It's Mr. Mason. Mason. that smell? Everybody out of the cabin! I like my meat rare. Try well done, bitch. Jack Mason knows he's going to die someday. Damn, I wish I'd never start smoking. But today, he's not in the mood. Uh, this is where it gets interesting. Never underestimate. Come on, Mason! A man who has nothing to lose. Rutger Hauer. Charles Dutton. Gary Busey. F. Murray Abraham. William McNamara. And Ice-T. Surviving the Game. Burn! Directed by Ernest Dickerson. Manhunting. Yeah. Most dangerous game for the 90s. <laughs> This is not a new genre. We we've seen this many a times. Like the newer ones, we've got what the Hunger Games. Yeah, um, yeah, Hunger Games. Uh, a year uh, before this was Hard Target. Hard Target. Yep, mm -hmm. it's another good example. Yeah, most dangerous game adaptations. Is is Predator? Uh, most dangerous game. Because I mean, the predators are coming down to hunt us. But isn't isn't the thing about most dangerous game? It's like rich people doing it for sport type thing. Isn't that supposed to be kind of the? Well, I think that's like the the start of it, and then it, they're like maybe predators kind of like a branch off. Like someone yeah. saw it and they're like, you know what? You know, it'd be cooler instead of rich people, aliens. Yeah. <laughs> so we've seen this a lot. Running Man, I guess that could kind of yeah. Be. Running Man's another good yeah. one. Yeah. Yep. That's all I got. I'm I'm starting to run out. I'm sure that I know this was like all of this started on some type of book in the 20s or something, but I don't remember. Didn't write it down. I don't have any notes for this movie. <laughs> it's just like all Steve's feelings. Yes. Well, and in and, and the book, I think it was called Most Dangerous Game. So, I mean, oh. it's <laughs> nice and simple for okay. you. Okay. All right. So <laughs> there was like a there was a 30s movie with Fay Ray, which is pretty good. But uh, I like King I'm gonna, Kong better. Shoot. I'm going to be honest. I think Surviving the Game is my favorite Most Dangerous Game. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't think I've ever sat down on, I don't know, Hard Target, John Woo, Jean-Claude, Greasy Mullet. <laughs> I need to go back and uh, polish up on my uh, Jean-Claude Van Damage anyway. Yeah, he's... I haven't well, seen a ton of his stuff, but the stuff I have seen, I do like. So I think I just need to go through the filmography one of these days. Oh, man. You, Let's stop at a certain point, though. You're going to come back and trying to do splits all the time. I'm like, man, <laughs> what are you doing? It's no different from every day anyway. <laughs> trying to do the splits right now as we speak. So for our Busey Christmas, Gary Busey style here, let's go through our history of surviving the game. Matt, have you seen this before? 
Yes, I've seen this a ton of times before. Uh, this was a staple for me in the 90s. Uh, we had HBO growing up. Well, we had the black box cable. We stole our cable, <laughs> like every good American family did in the early 90s. Um, no, not judging. <laughs> so we had like pay-per-view and HBO and stuff like that. And this one was just in heavy rotation for me. I, I liked it as a kid uh, and through into probably my teenage years. Uh, watched it maybe like every other year or something like that when it would pop up on HBO. This this definitely was a fixture on HBO for years. You couldn't like, especially when they added like HBO 2 and HBO Zone and all the different HBOs, this was always on. <laughs> so, but But then, giant gap. Maybe I was trying to figure before we started doing this, maybe about 15 years since I've seen this last. Yeah, mine is... I. Pretty sure I saw this in the late 90s on DirecTV. Um, we had that, and probably on USA, USA all, Up All Night, whatever that was. I remember this coming on. Um, had I mean, definitely didn't know anything about this when it first came out, because I was about, I don't know, 11, 12. That seems like the right age for me to rent this. But I don't remember this, but I do remember renting Hard Target. <laughs> I, was, I was the sicko... At probably like five years old, renting this, <laughs> you know. <That's laughs> I want to see. I want to see surviving the game, but that's... that's just me. That's just that's what you get. I'm a product of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It, it shaped you into it this did. warped ass person who's on the podcast. <laughs> it is. It's. De- I think it's a definitely a shaper movie because I have seen this movie a ton of times. Yeah. So for renting this, you want to break down the box art on it? Yeah. So we've got. Surviving the game. Rooker Hauer Ice T top lining this one. Rooker Hauer's face pretty huge looming over the uh sort of atmosphere and Ice T running who was in a target. Who was in a hard target <laughs> <laughs> uh running through the woods. Uh, next to him, Gary Busey looking all crazy with his uh uh some sort of automatic rifle of some I, sort. AK forty seven maybe sure. which I don't even think's in the movie. Um yeah, so Ice T and Ruger Hour take top billing over the uh, title. You've got them too. Uh, Gary Busey's name is listed at the bottom, and also starring with Charles Charles S. Dutton and F. Murray Abraham. And the tagline for the film is "The rules are simple: kill or be killed." And that's about it. Ice T running in a target in the woods. Ruger Hour looming over Gary Busey in a definitely added in like during the photo shoot for the film then they just popped him in they're like well gary Busey still moves units let's put him on the cover (laughs) yeah this is kind of your classic floating heads three quarter where they like the the top i would say one third actually the top one third is the floating head of rooker hauer and then gary Busey. you saw these all the time in the 90s and then the title kind of splits to the bottom and that's your action it's telling you what type of movie it is yes and if you didn't know already the side does tell you it is an action adventure film (laughs) oh okay good well i i don't want a romantic comedy with these three (laughs) in the woods oh yeah this is this is also one because this was 93 it's a new line release Obviously, we're back to New Line. We just keep coming back to New Line. Not gonna, on purpose, folks. We're going to call this the New Line podcast, and we're just going to watch all the New Line tapes. <laughs> it's pretty much what we did as kids. So, <laughs> um, But this was one in 93. Uh, Sony was still putting out, or not Sony at the time, Columbia TriStar was still putting out their tapes. I think 94 with The Mask is finally when New Line was on their own. Well, yeah, when they started to specifically be producing and distributing. Right. They didn't have to have the tapes come out through Columbia TriStar. But this is still a Columbia TriStar. Uh, But all the movies advertised when we get into the trailers are all New Line releases anyway. Yeah. So the distributor didn't actually, like, advertise any of their stuff. It probably was like a package deal. New Line was like, you could distribute it, but you got to put all our trailers on there. (laughs) Damn, New Line's calling shots. Yeah, and the next year they were putting out their own tapes. They didn't need Columbia TriStar anymore. Yeah, once they had Jim Carrey, it was done. Yeah, Dumb and Dumber in the Mask. They were good. They were solid. All the way through Lord of the Rings at that point. <laughs> and then they sold. <laughs> yep. Then, then Bob Shea cashed out and is living the high life right now. <laughs> uh, 
Taking selfies of himself. Actually, no, he's paying people to take <laughs> black and white shirtless Bob Shea photos of him. I don't know if you guys have seen those, but just Google it. I'm not, it, I'm serious. <laughs> oh, Bob Shea, never change. Flipping it over to the back, uh, we've got one review Fast and Furious, a winner from the Boston Globe. Our five pictures we have we have Ice T sort of scaling a waterfall. We've got Charles S. Dutton, Dutton pointing a gun towards camera. We've got F. Murray Abraham pointing a gun slightly off camera. <laughs> We've got Gary Busey uh, attacking Ice T. And then we have a lineup of all the guys, which is F. Murray Abraham, Gary Busey, Rooker Hauer, Charles S. Dutton, and The Son, <laughs> who is the only actor in this movie I don't know. I've seen him before doing like little bitty roles, but yeah, his name, pff, don't know, don't care. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's William McNamara. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, all right. Oh, I forgot. And yeah, John C. McGinley's in this too. Uh Dr. Cox? Yes. I love when he plays crazy. Oh yeah, he's oh I love him when he's in a nineties movie that I forgot he's in. And then I watch the tape and every time I'm like, hey, it's Dr. Cox. <laughs> he's great. He's great in this movie, he's great in every movie. He's a treasure. Yes. He's a national treasure. <laughs> um, all right, let's get to the description. If you don't know what this movie's about, it is. Explosive special effects and high-caliber weapons make for the ultimate manhunt in this hard-hitting action adventure starring Ice-T, Root Grauer, Charles S. Dutton, Gary Busey, and F. Murray Abraham. Ice-T is Mason, a homeless man recruited by a band of wealthy hunters to lead an exposition into the Pacific Northwest. But on the first day of the hunt, he discovers a lethal surprise. He's the prey. It's gut-wrenching action from start to finish as the game begins and the hunters learn a deadly lesson. Never underestimate a man who's got nothing to lose. Woo! That's it. One thing, I, I'm not going to read like the credit block or anything like that, but sometimes in credit blocks, they like highlight a name. Like the sort of like the star or like maybe somebody they want to attract your eyes to when you look at the credit block. For this movie, it's F. Murray Abraham. Oh. Which is weird. I I, yeah. I feel like he doesn't carry more prestige than some of the other guys. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. what Was he at this time period? Was he in something big? I don't know. This was like a long, like this was a good chunk of time after... Amadeus. Yeah. Right? Amadeus, Amadeus was, was like 87? 87? That's exactly, yeah. So six years later, he still is the highlighted name on here? Uh, you'd think the highlighted name here would be Rooker Hauer or Gary Busey. Yeah, I would I would assume Gary Busey because you've got Rooker Hauer and Ice T's name above the title. So then Gary Busey is probably your next highlighted person. But they're going with F. Murray Abraham here. Now, when did Speed come out? Or not Speed, I'm sorry. When did... um. Oh, uh, Keanu Reeves, Point Break. 90? Okay, yeah. I, I thought it was like 90, 91, somewhere around there. I was thinking, yeah, Gary Busey should be your highlighted yeah. name in an action film, or Rooker Hauer. Yeah. Weird. Odd. Yeah, odd. just something I wanted to point out from the back of the box that I thought was interesting. Another odd thing is the director's credits throughout his career. Yeah, he's either gone. So this is this is one of my favorite directors. Uh, yeah, this is Ernest like Dickerson. Uh, but here he's credited not on the back of the box, but in the movie is Ernest R. Dickerson, which I think he was doing a lot early in his career. Yes, and I've seen a lot of Ernest Dickerson's. Um, he actually did one of my favorite episodes of The Walking Dead. Uh, I think it's called like Eighteen Miles to Go or something like that. It's the second season, which a lot of people hate. Uh, but there are some really good episodes in it. I'm and, I'm with you on this one. And, I think there's some really great episodes in the second season, and, and he did a bang up job. Yeah, and that's the one where um, Rick Rhymes and Shane fight for like leadership. It's it's like a they're trying to figure out who's the leader, which way to go, and they have a fight, and then zombies you know spray out after him, and then before you know it, I think Dale dies in that episode or the next one. Spo spoilers <laughs> if you're if you don't already know what happened in the second season of walking yeah. dead that's your own damn fault <laughs> so dickerson's filmography he really went hardcore into tv yes um some of his film well where he started was he shot do the right thing with spike lee yes he's spike lee's cinematographer for a few years then catches a break with juice mm -hmm. in the early 90s and then um, then we get Surviving the Game, and then we get Demon Knight, and then we get Bulletproof. 
Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. all three of these movies. <laughs> yeah, he, he became a uh, director for hire, which is fine. Uh, I don't think he was at the beginning a director for hire because I think Juice, Surviving the Game, Demon Knight, and Bulletproof all have a very distinct style on them. It's only kind of after that when he goes into TV that I think he loses kind of his edge a little bit. Well, I mean, like he's hired to do someone else's story, which is which is oh, fine. He's, yeah, he's not yeah. a writer. No. Yeah, no, no. so he gets into this and he, yeah, specifically... You can tell from his style, especially like, well, Bulletproof and Surviving the Game have a lot of the same styles. Um, Tales from the Crypt is kind of just on its own planet, in my opinion. It's it's him doing Tales from the Crypt. So yeah. You have his style meets the EC comic style, and it's fucking wonderful. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. But he also later kind of came back to the urban horror genre with uh, Bones, which I think is criminally underrated as a super fun horror movie. Yeah, I'll be honest. I've not seen it. You should. You should see it. We uh, should do it. We'll I didn't it. know. I didn't know he did it. It's a really fun. Everybody was like, "Oh, that's that horror movie that Snoop Dogg's in. It's probably terrible." No, it's pretty fun. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Well, I know he did uh, Dexter a few episodes, maybe like ten episodes of Dexter. I never watched and Dexter. I really loved Dexter until the last couple seasons, where it was like, "Oh, what are we doing?" But I don't know if he was a part of that. But anyway. Uh, he does this very, I would say he's very kinetic with the way he shoots things. It's, it's, there's a lot of movement with his camera. He's not a voyeur. Right. He is, he is, yes, very active. Uh, the camera is a character in his movies there. It's flying around all over the place. Uh, yeah, I think he was kind of the perfect choice for Demon Knight because Demon Knight's kind of doing like an evil dead thing. And he kind of does that with surviving the game a little bit here. Um, he, he kind of also, we actually mentioned this in the episode that Alex was on back when we did Death Wish 5. Dickerson kind of invented, because he shot Do the Right Thing and a few other movies in the 90s, he invented that early 90s look. When you think of like the way those early 90s movies look, where they're sweaty and they're, you know, it's woodsy and brown, but like brown in a good way, like he kind of invented that look. Well, if he didn't invent it, he at least is like one of the godfathers of it. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I say he invented it because he was a cinematographer first. So, I mean, he created okay, that yeah. like look before he went on to direct. But yeah, he he's he's well, pretty he amazing. Uses, he uses some action Dutch angles. I where, love action Dutch angles. <laughs> or like he has, I think in this movie too, he has Ice T like jump over the camera. Yes. At one, and I'm like, oh, this is so nineties. <laughs> it's, it's fucking wonderful. Uh, well, okay, so let's uh, let's pop this tape in and let's uh, review the trailers here. Now playing at a motion picture theater near you. Uh, the first one we got, what was it, Bitter Moon? No, first one is Above the Rim. Above the Rim. Okay. Which is basically just like a teaser trailer saying the cast in showing basketball. Yeah, this is your, your Wayne's brother, Marlon Wayne's. Marlon Wayne's is in this. Yeah. Uh, Leon is in this. Dwayne Martin. I'm trying to think yeah. of other people from the 90s that pop up. Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's... Well, I think this has Tupac in it, too. Tupac is in yeah. it, and he's doing the song that's over the trailer. Mm-hmm. I want to see this. Never seen it before. Me neither. I feel uh, like I've passed the tape before. Well, I feel like there were so many basketball movies in the early to mid 90s. I mean, one of the most popular, obviously, is White Men Can't Jump. Yeah. But there was a lot. Yes, there was. I think there was a uh, Denzel Washington one, too. Yes. Oh, what the hell was that what one? What the hell was that? Uh, either way, I can't remember. A lot of basketball movies. <laughs> yeah, he got game. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we got go. Got there. Got there. Spike Lee. Yeah. Wasn't uh, there a Shaq one too? Shaq basketball movie. Where Shaq could play basketball. He was like from some country, and they brought him over for college to play. I don't know. Whatever. I think I own it. It's Air like, up there. Is it Kevin Bacon? Yeah. Air yeah. up there. I didn't know Shaq was in that movie. Well, he maybe he's not. I don't oh, okay. know. I, I, never, I, get the, I, never I don't know. I've don't never know. seen it. So <laughs> I own that Kevin Bacon movie. I've never seen it though. I just bought it because it's like, oh, Kevin Bacon when he was struggling. <laughs> oh, the nineties. Great time for movies. Uh yeah, no, basketball movies are really popular, but I missed this one. I never saw this one. Uh and I want to. I like these kind of like urban city set dramas, you know. They tend to be more juicy than the suburban set dramas. <laughs> okay, so was the mask the second one? Bitter Moon then was. Bitter the Moon was the second one. Uh, never seen. 
I've seen it. Roman Polanski, Polanski. Roman Polanski, yeah. I'm not a fan of Roman Polanski, but I have seen this movie. I saw it in a class, actually. Uh, and I'm not, not a fan of Roman Polanski because of his past or whatever. I'm just not a fan of him. Oh, oh what past? <laughs> I don't know much about him as a man. Well, he, he supposedly had sex with like a 15-year-old or 13-year-old or something like that, and that's why he fled the country. Oh, so he should be in Hollywood now. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Right. Well, he got... He fled the country, but then got the standing ovation when he won Best Director for The Pianist, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> so Hollywood was still... At that point, was still uh, not hiding the fact that they loved their pedophilia, I guess. <laughs> so they were the Catholic Church right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, now they're at least being more discreet about it. They're sweeping the Bryan Singers under the rugs. <laughs> well, now they're just publicly trying to bury everyone, which is what you should do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't, like, have sex with kids. Like, that's Like the Catholic one. <laughs> Church is doing now. They're like, hey, here's an entire list, all you fuckers. And some of you are dead. We just want all of you to know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Roman Polanski did that. But before, besides that, separating the man yeah. from the art i never really liked his movies because i'm not a fan of as you mentioned his kind of like fly on the wall type of style like plop a camera down and just watch characters talk yeah. i like dickers i like kinetic energy i like somebody who can fucks with the camera yeah i'm back and forth on that sometimes i like it because it really showcases the acting yeah i tend to like it more like the sort of plop a camera down mm-hmm. And film actors when it's a writer director, so they're just filming like their juicy dialogue, okay. like an early Kevin Smith or something like that, where it's yeah. like Kevin Smith well, didn't have much visual style, but he could write like crazy. So you want to see that. But like Rome Polanski was not directing any of his scripts for the most part, so it was like, why then? <laughs> yeah, and little I also, style into it, dude. He also made movies in a different time period where they were relying on. You know, acting. Yeah. Like Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, Rosemary's Baby. Right. And I'm sure there's a ton of other one we're forgetting, but uh, I'm not going to pull up his name. Um, yeah. He's just that type of director. But moving on to something that is completely different. <laughs> yes. The Mask. The Mask. We, we've we gotten this one already before. Yeah. We got it now and then, right? I think so. Yeah. We are going to keep getting The Mask until we cover the mask <laughs> yeah and even when we do the mask it, the mask trailer will probably be in it yes or yeah <laughs> definitely like, dumb and dumber you a, after we do it we're still gonna see it yeah. in other new line movies as we continue to make this the new line podcast um, <laughs> yeah but just just watch the mask if you haven't seen it what's wrong with you yeah it's it's one of the greatest american films of all time <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fuck all those other films like Chinatown. <laughs> We're going I, straight hey, to the mask. I'll take the mask over Chinatown any day of the week. <laughs> I had to watch that for film class, and that movie sucks. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't suck. It sucks to, I mean, for what we like, it sucks. It's Yeah, it sucks to, like, enjoy? <laughs> I guess you could study it. Yeah, I feel you like you can't I'm, just pop it in. I feel You're ever like, like I just want to watch Chinatown today and feel bad about myself. <laughs> someone out there who studies film is like having a fucking heart attack li- listening to us talk about Good. this. But um, <laughs> that's my job here on this podcast. <laughs> some movies like that, I feel like I'm doing homework. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Whatever. So let's get into the feature presentation. And now our feature presentation. And here we go. We find Ice T and a. A dog is killed within 10 minutes, and I hate it. Yeah, man, this movie starts out real brutal because you see the guys on the hunt going to kill a person. Like, So we know what this movie is about right away. They're not trying to like turn it into a twist or anything like that. We know that there are dudes that go out and hunt people. And it's intercut with the brutality of the streets where Ice-T is just... Uh, feeding a dog and the dog wants to chase a cat because even the dog's a hunter everybody's a hunter yeah everything's everything's being hunted uh the dog wants to go after a cat and then the cat the dog gets hit by a taxi which then the taxi driver proceeds to punch ice tea in the face because of it <laughs> yeah and ice tea's just like are you done like he doesn't even retaliate yeah which i mean he's just he's at the end of his rope because uh, we find out later this character lost his his wife and his kid in a fire yeah yeah Uh, so i mean he's he's done he's got he's got a dog and a homeless man and now he's lost the dog 
And very soon he loses his homeless man friend as well. <laughs> yeah, who's like trying to be his mentor. And he's just like, yeah, you got a lot to live for. You, you got to find like, something yeah. to live for. And all that. You know, so we, we've seen this. This is the, I, I don't know, it's kind of like the Obi-Wan in yeah. a way. And, of course, then you have to have something set off the story. And we have the old man die, which has, I don't know, Rooker Howard's helper come. Yeah, Charles S. Dutton. Yeah. Ket, like, sees that Ice-T is going to commit suicide after his yeah. friend has died. Uh, and his friend dies, I'm assuming, because he got beat up by the security guard when Ice-T was trying to steal the food. I'm assuming that's what killed him. Like, Yeah, he got he, hit in the he, stomach. He gets and then, hit in like, the ribs and yeah, the stomach died, a few times. He so. died peacefully in his sleep, at least. But I'm assuming that's what killed him, was that. I assume, yeah. Plus, uh, he was really old. And he was I mean, old. I mean, and home, and I'm, homeless. I'm pretty sure homeless and old is not a good, you know, yeah, not a good equi- equation there for you know coming out something good. Uh, yeah. So he, yeah, once once he loses his friend Ice, he's like, I'm gonna jump in front of this Mack truck. And Charles S. Dutton, who is like feeding homeless people, he's got like a missionary T-shirt on. He's like mission something with a cross on it. Um, and he's like feeding the homeless people in the neighborhood. And he's like, I'll feed you too. And he sees him go to you know kill himself. And he saves him, but we only find we find out that Charles S. Dutton, even though he's like being like, "Hey, man, you got a lot to live for. I'll help you out. I'll get you a job." He's in on this. He's one of the hunters. Yeah, that's it's rough too that he works at like a soup kitchen and he's just basically finding strong younger homeless men to hunt. Right, and like we find out later, or not later, but a little bit later in the movie, that he knows how to pick them because he picks out the hog that they eat, the pig, yeah. for like the pig roast they have or whatever. Um, By the way, that entire dinner, when we get to that, is glorious. Yes, that's that's when the movie kicks into high gear for me. Because yeah. I feel like the first part of this movie, like this section that we're talking about right now, is kind of a, just a massive bummer. It's good. It's, it's a functional yeah. thing, but it's just like, man, life sucks for everybody here <laughs> well instead of investing a lot of time into the dog before the dog dies they decide to go with the older man his mentor which i kind of think is a mistake well the dog is the older man's dog too yeah it's but, not ice T's dog but i was thinking if the mentor died at the beginning and then his dog that he becomes friends with like gives him a glimmer of hope of life he's like you know if i can take care of this dog maybe i can get my life back and then the dog would have died I think that's rock bottom. I want, <laughs> but maybe that's just a personal thing. Yeah, you could you could have went that way for yeah. sure. Well, I mean, because dogs, especially dogs, man's best friend. Like, right. I don't know. That's just the way I like it. But uh, yeah, we basically just go off to Oregon, and they convince him, "Hey, you're going to be a hunting guide," which is fucking stupid. You're taking a guy because he even says it. Like when Rooker Hauer is like, "Well, if you can run on this treadmill for thirty minutes." I guess you can come because you have Stanima. Yeah, and I'll he, give you twenty dollars too. <laughs> yeah, to run on a treadmill. Yeah, and he's like, I'll run anywhere. I'll run to Alaska for twenty dollars. <laughs> it's a funny joke. I'm glad you got that in because that's <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> Ice T's fucking awesome in this movie. He's like he's so watchable. Like his charisma is oozing in every scene he's in. Yeah, I the only thing I have with him in this, and this is small. It's really small. Is I feel like his character's too smart to fall for this, and that's why they had to shove in like the oh we're gonna overpay you, yeah maybe, or or just like a man he's smart but he's desperate he's yeah. just like this ain't right but I need this money <laughs> I just have a feeling that he would be like man fuck this I'm not going <laughs> yeah he he goes along for it yeah. and that's when that's when Rutger Hauer is the one that works with S Dutton uh cl- the closest. We get out there, and that's when we meet John C. McGinley, Gary Busey, F. Murray Abraham, and uh, his son. <laughs> yeah, the kid. The kid, who Which... screams this whole movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, he is so annoying. I Like, he's clearly, like, 20-something, but they're having him play it like, like he's, a teenager. like, 13. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get it. I was like, you're in college. You're not this dumb. Like... First of all, if you've got all these men hunting, if, if I'm in his shoes um, and my dad took me to this and I find out we're all hunting a human, I am not going to sit there and bitch and whine. These fuckers will kill you. Yeah, I'd just be like, I'm out. Like, you guys do this. Hey, I'm You're just my dad. Gonna, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to leave. I'm, I'm just, just going to go home. sit in the cabin. <laughs> I'm just... 
And I'm if out. they're like, oh, you can't sit in the cabin, you're going to hunt with us. Oh, okay, I'll carry everything. I, yeah. I'm just like, don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to shoot a dude. It's like, at that point, it's like, I'm not a hunter. Spoiler alert, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but at that point, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go shoot some deer. You guys do your thing. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I would rather do that than, uh, you know, hunt a guy. The sun is easily the worst part of this film. Yes. Uh, no but at the same time, it doesn't, like, take me out of the movie. You know, like, sometimes well, you have a... except scream. It doesn't take me out. It just makes me laugh, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Um, there are some... There, sometimes you get a character in a movie who's so annoying that, like, you just... You hate the movie. You turn on the movie. It's yeah. not that bad. It's just, like, dumb. It's just... I don't. Yeah. I wish he wasn't there, but whatever. I can still watch it. I see yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, but so when we get into these these characters hamming it up, and it's a beautiful thing because uh, Gary Busey's speech, yeah. where he talks about his birthmark, which yes. I'll play right here. How'd you get that fucked up scar up under your eye? I refer to that as my birthmark. On my eighth birthday, my father brought me a bulldog, a fat little bulldog. I named him Prince Henry Stout. He was strong. He would chase my pet turkey. He would chase squirrels up the tree. I trained him. I raised him. I fed him. I groomed him. I took care of him. I love that dog. I love that dog. More than anything in the world, I love that dog. My father gave me a handful of cherry bombs and M80s and said, you're going to train this dog to be a protector. So every Saturday afternoon, I got behind a little dummy my dad built, and I'd toss these cherry bombs and M80s at the dog. Boom, boom! That dog was scared at first, but after a while he got angry and he would come at the dummy. Well, he'd get the dummy and rip it apart. Head was off, shirt was gone. So, 13 years old, birthday time, got me a 12 gauge shotgun. <laughs> We're going hunting. I was so excited. We went out in the clearing in the woods. My dad laid his gun down, took my gun and laid it down and said, Son, today you're going to learn to control your emotions. You're going to do things that some men are unable and unwilling to do. Follow me. I followed my dad. We went around a clump of trees. There's a little corral built. There's Prince Henry Stout chained in the middle of the corral. My dad took out a pocket full of cherry bombs and put them in my hand and said, Get in the corral. Here's a lighter. I want you to light those cherry bombs and throw them at the prince. You're going to face manhood. You're going to fight that dog to the death. He's going to kill you or you're going to kill him. Now! Boom! Yeah! He was on me. He was on me like flies on shit. I had no chance. I got my arm up between his teeth and my neck. Whomp! Went down in the mud. Rolled over. Rolled over. That dog is fighting and biting and scratching and kicking. And I'm screaming and crying. I'm grabbing him around the head. I stand up. Fall with my weight on it. Here's neck break. He's dead. He's not breathing. He's not yelping. He's not biting. I'm covered with blood. I stand up. I wipe the blood off. I lick it. My dad says, welcome to manhood. That's why this is a birthmark. That wow, it's wow. amazing. Do you think he even they even wrote that? I bet they wrote a simpler version of that. Yeah, and then he just went and added like the dog bark sounds and the like other Swe- sound effects that he adds in there. He's sweating at the end of yes. it. It's wow, that's a glorious moment. Now I did find something finally on the scriptwriter of this. I can't remember his name, but I read an interview and his. First of all, the, the, the role was not written for Gary Busey. It was written just, you know, like, hey, this person is the first one to die. And they're like, oh, Gary Busey's going to get this. And then after they saw the dailies and everything, they're like, fuck. He's so good in this. <laughs> fuck. Why did we kill him first? But it wasn't on purpose. It was just like, that's the character he got. Right. I think it's kind of actually amazing that they go that way because he's so... You're in this scene where you're finding they're doing the pig roast and they're eating the pig and you're learning about all the characters 
you've got all these great character actors all chewing scenery. Oh, just all of them. It is a showcase for like 20 minutes of just all of them overacting each other. There's barely any wall left. They chewed so much scenery. And it's wonderful. I love this section of the movie. Uh, But yeah, Gary Busey obviously steals the show with his bulldog speech about oh. killing his own dog. Yeah, which is like, I think something, it's like a folklore of what the Nazi officers used to do. Mm. I don't know if that actually ever happened or it was just made up through time. Like, I'm sure Jewish people would tell the story of like, that's how bad they were. Right. The officers would kill their puppies. And that and that is Gary Busey in this movie. But I think having him die first is actually really smart then because he stands out in that scene of overacting and then you work your way down type thing. See, I would have rather had him have the the Dutton death, which mm. we'll get to. You know what I'm talking about on the STV or the yes. ATV? Yeah. Yes. So, all right. Uh, they go out hunting, and we get all these characters chewing scenery, which, by the way, Dr. Cox plays like an eccentric Texas oil baron, or at least the kid of an oil... He's got a lot of money. He's from he's, Texas. Yeah, and he is there because... It's almost like a revenge thing for him because his daughter was killed by a homeless man. Yeah. So he's <laughs> nuts in this. But like in and fading in and out of nuts, which is kind of fun to watch because I've seen him play nuts and I've seen him play subdued. It's kind of fun in this movie to watch him play both. Yeah, because it's almost like sometimes they're telling him, OK, here we need you to four. And then other times they're like, go at a 10, but maybe hit a 12. <laughs> yeah, go a little higher than a 10 if you yeah. can. Like the scene when Ice-T is like, I killed my wife and daughter. And he's he just goes ballistic. Yeah. And like they like have to throw him outside. I don't know where he goes, but they like push him outside. Yeah, and this is before the hunt starts. Yeah. This is when he's still supposed to be their guide. Yeah. So like, I mean, if, if you're Mason, which by the way, uh, the character... Ice-T's character's name is Mason. They say Mason so much in this film, yes. I'm never going to forget his fucking name. Yes, I don't know what any of the other characters' names are exactly. in this movie, but yeah. I know Mason. Yeah. They it's... say it a hundred times. And they show it at one point because during the hunt, which is, he wakes up the next morning and they take him, they're like, surprise, motherfucker, yeah. run. <laughs> um, he ends up in a room full of heads which I wondered if it was the same room that they used in fucking Walking Dead. I know. I was, I was exactly. Like this, Dickerson I was like, was like working with them at the time. I was like, is that the same fucking room? Um, but. Uh, uh, oh. Oh. What was that? Phone down. The phone? Oh. Well, folks, that's what happens when you got a phone in your pocket. Everybody, everybody makes mistakes. We're all humans here. <laughs> <laughs> We're but, the dangerous game, though. Yes. The most dangerous game. Yes. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so yeah, he goes into a room full of heads, severed heads that are in jars. And one of them says Mason and it's empty. Yeah. Now this was after they started the hunt. Right. Yeah. Cause right. So they start the hunt by like doing, they wake him up with a gun to his face in the morning and then they start clapping, you know, like what they would do to like get, uh, you know, an campers. animal <laughs> or campers out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And, and it's to like get him just his adrenaline pump in. They're like, we're hunting you down. We're giving you a head start. Then they sit and they eat breakfast. And Ruker Hauer is like such a weird character in this because first of all, he's out of shape. Yes. This is Ruker Hauer where he has let himself go. And he's older. He's yeah. got the gray and white hair. Like now he's not the uh, blonde no. hottie that he wasn't uh, lady hawk anymore so he's like telling gary Busey's character to calm down let's let's give him a head start he's you know never been in the woods we need to make this sporting we need from rooker Hauer, he wants more of a challenge and he he literally says to gary Busey, he says treat this like foreplay yes and oh God. I, okay the eating in this the night before when they did the dinner you can hear all of them chewing, and it's it made me really uncomfortable. <laughs> then the next morning, you can hear them like clacking on the plates, cutting up whatever their ham or whatever left over, eating their eggs, and I'm like, ah. In movies, when they have them just like putting the microphone right next to their mouth while they're, um, 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 I can't stand it. It makes me so uncomfortable. I I would wager to bet that that would be on purpose oh, in yes. this movie. Oh yeah. 
Other movies, I think it's just in there. <laughs> yeah. This movie, I think, is totally on purpose because you're supposed to be like, God, these guys are the worst. Like, from well, pretty the, early on. They're, they're selling the savage in man. Yes. So they're, you know, eating the flesh. Yeah, they're eating like cape. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, they get him out. And he's a clever character because they chase him down in ATVs, but somehow he turned around and he goes back to the cabin to find the heads. And then we get the conflict with him and Gary Busey where they start fighting, and he sets up a trap. It's a good trap, by the way. Goes in through the front door, but he's laid all the gas down. All the way to the back yeah. door. Locks the back door, and since Gary Busey shut the front door anyway, makes like just you know all this pressure inside of there with all that gas, and he lights it, and he goes, boom! Yeah, and I think, I think they're trying to say, too, the formaldehyde, or whatever for the heads, also caused the oh, explosion, too, because yeah. we see the glass breaking first before the explosion. Uh, so yeah, but be- between the gas and the formaldehyde, it just makes this house go up. But it's not without a fight between Gary Busey and Ice T, mm-hmm. where Gary Busey is pushing him against the wood when the house is on fire, and he's like, "I like my meat rare," which then Ice T throws him into the house before it explodes and says, "Extra crispy." <laughs> I like mine extra crispy. <laughs> Boom! House explodes. I'm like, okay, I can see why I love this movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's the fun no, 90s have arrived. action. Yeah, it's like, I mean, the one-liners in the late 80s and early 90s action films are like trailer moment. Boom. Mm-hmm. I'll be back. Yeah. We fucking love them. I love them. I'm not above them. <laughs> yeah. And here here we are. This is where we are in the movie. But yeah, Gary Busey's the first to go. Uh, but he, he gets to choose some scenery, too, in that eating scene that we were just talking about, the breakfast scene, because he's like, I want to go. I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> he's like... He well, is definitely like a wild animal in this movie. Clearly, he, his character was the most aggressive. That's why he dies first. Right. That, that's what they were trying to sell. So, you know, it's it was fun. And then we get him running back out. And it, But this is like, it's elevated. Because clearly this group's never lost anyone before. Right. So there's panic. You know, like, should we leave? But not from Rooker Hauer. No, no, Rooker no, Hauer's no. like, no, we, we got no, this. No, Dutton and Rooker Hauer are just sitting there like, mm-mm. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, we finally got someone worth yeah. hunting. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> I, I find it hysterical because Rooker Hours is so, he's, his character's so weird. Yeah. He's like weird in this movie. He's yeah. like, like, we're not selling how weird his performance is. Like, he, his role on paper is just like the guy that organizes this whole, the rich guy that organizes yeah. this whole thing. But Rooker Hauer has found a way to just make him like, Almost like a caricature of like Ted Nugent or something like that. <laughs> like yeah. it is so weird his choice, and well, I love it. His, I love it. His business attire that he wears at the beginning, and his entire look with like a scrangly beard, long hair, like it makes no sense. But I guess what they're trying to sell is he's so rich he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, he's just a weird eccentric rich yeah. guy. So uh, they go back out hunting for him. And I don't remember, oh, yes, this, that's right. Ice-T ends up catching Dr. Cox. Yes, and ties him up and gets on his, like, phone, his microphone thing, uh, his headphone microphone thing. Oh, the giant walkie-talkies they had? Well, the, the, but he was, they used the things. They might have yeah, walkie-talkies, that's right. but no. they used the headsets yeah, they had the, the talk. Like the headsets from the 90s when you With, answer yeah, your phone. Yeah, the yeah. foam, the foam earpieces yeah. and the tiny little tiny tiny little microphone that comes to your mouth Mm -hmm. uh yeah and he goes like i've got whatever the character's name is if you let me go i'll tell you where he is if you don't you then yeah i'll kill him (laughs) and and ice tea the next and they know where he is because ice tea clearly doesn't understand that if you're in a cave and you have a fire going you can see it from a really far so they know where ice tea is but he gets himself a shotgun that dr cox was carrying and he lets him go after him you know he told his story of like hey man i had a wife and a kid yeah this is where we learn about what really happened to ice t's family and then we learn about what happened to mcginley's family so Mm -hmm. dr cox dr cox's family (laughs) he doesn't have a real name (laughs) he's a character um so yeah he uh, once dr cox mcginley is out the next morning he's just like you know what i'm done going home this guy had a chance to kill me he didn't I'm not going to kill him. That's like, you know, we're square. Yeah, and he's like, you're not going to shoot me in the back if I try to leave. And Ruger Howard's like, no. And he turns around, and he's like, what? 
And or, or no, he says, "Yeah, I will." And he's like, "What?" And then Charles S. Dutton shoots him in the head, and he goes, "I lied," or whatever, or something like that. Yeah. Like some kind of like '90s one-liner so, thing. So now they've turned on each other, right? And now this is now we have the son at peak screaming. Oh, <laughs> dad, dad, dad! Oh, I should probably rip that. Yeah, we should let you people do like know. a super cut of all the times that kid screams in that movie. Dad! Stay here, Derek. Fuck you, Dad. Fuck you. Dad, help me! I can't hold on! Derek! Ah! I'm coming! Help! Ah! Oh, he's so... Oh, okay. I, I can't think of him. He's going to give me a headache. So, they kill one of their own, and now we have the... You know, it escalates even more. The three, the kid, um, whatever the other character's name, they're going after him, and they get on a log when they're chasing him because I see. Well, no, you're you're skipping the Charles S. Dutton ATV explosion. Then I thought that was after the tree. Mm-mm, the log is next because that's when we lose the sun. Yeah, that's Char- what I mean. Like Charles S. Dutton goes first. Oh, he does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's clever what he does. He sets up the ATV. He takes the igniter. The you know when you put in the key and your ignition would ignite and that's how you start some. He takes the igniter, puts it in the gas tank. So as soon as he starts it, fumes go off. Boom, boom. Charles all of a sudden goes flying. He's got no legs and like neck up, just burns yeah. everywhere. And he's just overacting his ass off when he's on the ground, like he's in yeah. like a Saving Private Ryan kind of war movie or <gasps> something. Oh, it's, I yeah yeah he's saying yeah. like random things and yeah and then. Ruger Hauer goes over him, and I thought he was strangling him, but he didn't look... He kills him. I think he was like... The way he takes his fingers, which is so weird. Again, just it, a it, weird just Ruger Hauer. Weird. I think he's like literally closing his air like passageway or like holding down his like... The you know the his main jugular, artery or yeah, whatever. Yeah, the, the artery up there. Well, whatever it was, I guarantee you the screenwriter and everyone was just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and they're like, it's great. Just leave it. <laughs> Whatever, whatever. Howard's just being weird again. Yeah. <laughs> and then Dutton dies uh, the most over the top way possible. I mean, this is straight up like like 1940s where they get shot and they're like, oh, no, I'm dying. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> I laughed. I laughed during it. The man's dying and I'm cracking up. Yeah, because it's it's hysterical and they're the bad guys. You want to like kind of like be like, ha, I got you. Like that one was awesome, though. That was Yeah, great. the ATV yeah. explosion was pretty wonderful. Then, then it's the log. Okay. So they chase him yeah. around again, and then they get him. They get him on a log, and they're all crossing it, trying to get to him. And Ice T is just throwing shit at them, trying to cross this log, which just causes the stupid son just to fall. He just <laughs> falls. <laughs> yeah, and you could tell the editor didn't have a shot of him falling either because they cut away on his fall. And I knew right then the editor's like, you didn't get a shot of that? And they're like, ooh. <laughs> ooh. We, they have, they have what kind of looks like a blue screen of like him falling. Yeah, like down. But then it's... Then they but cut. they don't have him slipping off the tree. Right, there's no, and there's no impact of any sort. They're no, they cut nothing. away. There's no sort of sound effect or anything. And clear, we know. Yeah. We yeah. know. I, I just think someone messed up. Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, an editor, they probably needed someone, you know, maybe a script advisor... He's like, hey, make sure you get him slipping off. Oops. <laughs> yeah, and he just falls to his death, and that's the end of that annoying character. <laughs> yeah, he's gone. I, I didn't even flinch. I was like, oh, all right. Yep, moving on. on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember how the dad dies. Oh, fuck. I just watched this, like, mere moments ago, and I'm already forgetting how he No, I, the dad dying is one of the mo- It's so forgettable. Oh, they, so it's going to be night. <laughs> So they do this, and F. Mary Abraham, the father, wants revenge, but it's yeah. going to be night, and Ruger Hauer's like, calm down, we'll get him in the morning. Naturally, he doesn't calm down. He wants revenge. Goes after him at night, but Ice-T's waiting for him. So they have a big fight, and then Ice-T just snaps his neck. Yeah, wow. I do remember the nap snap. Yeah, it was, it's bad. It's, 
I well, mean, no, the, the death isn't bad. The whole setup, because I feel like... It's moving very fast it's, now. It's very rushed. Yes, it's moving very fast at this point. But we get that, that cuts us off of uh, F. Murray Abraham, and now it's just the final chase between Rooker Hauer and Ice-T as, like, daylight is breaking. And this final chase actually shows how ruthless Rooker Hauer's character is. Because Ice-T, I think, makes it to the plane or something... Uh, he sees Ruger Howard going to the plane. So he it, follows yeah, him yeah. to the plane. He gets to the plane and he's not there. Well, doesn't Ruger Howard go through the plane? He like goes all the way through it. Yeah. Then Ice T comes up to it and Ruger Howard thinks Ice T's in the plane and then blows it up with the pilot in it, right? No, the pilot's not in there though. Okay. All right. But he cro- yeah, he crosses through it, gives it enough time for Ice T to see that he's in the plane, then yeah. goes out the other end. Waits for Ice T to come up to the plane and then shoots at the gas. Yeah, that's ruthless. You're blowing up your own plane. That's yes. a lot of money. Yes, but because he is rich, he has another plane, yeah. <laughs> which I, he, yeah. he then gets away on. Yeah, and he's a pilot, so he's prepared. Right. Uh, what? I, man, I really thought there was a pilot in that plane. I don't know how I made that up. I mean, um, there might have been that I missed. I watched but, it like a week ago. Yeah, but I, I you know... I mean, we watch all these together. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I watched it today, and I don't think there was a pilot. But I, I, if, oh, if the, I believe you, yeah, if yeah. there was though, there's good. Ch- there's still a good chance. My Pretty. my brain is at like half capacity at most times. Yeah. So, <laughs> but we get back to the city, and we <laughs> chose Rooker Howard dressed up as a priest. Yes, he is like he's like dyeing his beard and eyebrows. And then he is in, like, full priest. He's got, like, he has, like, his hair is done. Like, he has it in, yes. like, a braid. Like, somebody took the time to, like, put that hair together for him. Or he did. I don't know. <laughs> what they don't tell you is, is he on the run changing his appearance? Or is this, like, was he pretending to be a businessman at the beginning and he's, like, a con artist that steals all these guys' money? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I know. I was trying to figure it out too, and I was like, "Well, let's just go with he's on the run." Yeah, he could be. He could be like masquerading as a priest all the time in that missionary thing yeah. that S. Dutton was a part of too. So maybe I don't know. May I don't know. But he's going through the alleys, so you know he's got a car that won't uh, start because you kind of figure out that Ice T, you know, sabotaged it. Right. So he followed him all the way from I think they were in Oregon to Seattle to Seattle. So I mean. It's not that far, but it's far. It's far when you have on no foot. money. Yeah, no, no <laughs> money, and you're on foot. But yes. he's a homeless man. He's used to this. Yes, he can. He can yeah. get by. So he goes from the the woods of the nowhere woods of Oregon back to the city in Seattle, and yeah, he leaves the bike. Maybe that's how he got back. Was the because it's the bike that Rooker Howard. That's right. Was yeah, riding. He, he leaves it in know. the alley. So maybe that's how he got back. Yeah. Um, he leaves it in the alley. Howard sees it, and he like pulls his gun out. And he's gonna, he's gonna kill Ice T. He knows he's around, and Ice T surprises him. But Ice T doesn't kill him. No, he doesn't. He and takes, you're like, oh man, he's yeah, gonna let him live. <laughs> Beats him up, takes his gun, like takes. First of all, he takes the 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 bullet out of the chamber, but he leaves it on the ground like that. You hear the tink tink tink. tink. Yeah. Then he takes the clip out and throws the clip, puts the gun on the ground, and you know like. Wait, immediately my brain went like, well, that's fucking dumb. He's just going to go grab the gun. What are you doing here? You knew there had to be a setup. Yeah. But what we didn't tell you is earlier in the film, he was told you always have to check the barrel of a gun for debris because it could blow up in your hand. I don't remember when they told him that. I think the old man said that. Probably, yeah, during like the dinner or something like that, or when they met each yeah. other or whatever, somewhere in there. Something like that. So Ruger Hauer stuffs debris inside of the the actual barrel of the gun. So when Ruger Hauer grabs the gun, puts the one bullet in the chamber, points it at him, and kind of like, you know, you should have killed me. Ruger Hauer explodes, but he completely disappears. Yes, he explodes into nothing, and Ice-T's like, gotta check the barrel. Walk away from camera. Credits. Yeah. <laughs> Look at me. Hey, Mason! Burns is something you should always do when you find a gun. Say goodbye. Always check the barrel. 
And so I was my, like, that's how you fucking end a movie. <laughs> yeah, but he wouldn't fully explode like that. His hand would and his face would. That, I was just like, did someone not actually know how to fire a gun? Or maybe, maybe they didn't have the... Um, you know, like the makeup people to do all the special yeah, effects maybe. for it. And they were just like, oh, we'll just have them kind of blow up. We'll just show some smoke. Yeah. And it'll be good. Because it would have been funny if his hand would have just blown off, his face would have been all scarred, and then Ice-T would have walked right over and been like, got to check the barrel. <laughs> yeah. But instead, he walks away from camera and the credits start rolling. Yeah. So, do we actually recommend surviving the game? If you come across this tape in the wild absolutely pick it up i feel like you're gonna see the tape more frequently than you'll see this on dvd <laughs> but uh definitely pick it up if you come across it it's i think this movie's an amazing good time just it's, super fun if you like 80s 90s schlock action it's perfect it's it's definitely one of the better ones for sure it's like high art low art <laughs> <laughs> highbrow yeah. lowbrow yeah, in the best way possible it's high it's 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 lowbrow art. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is this is a must see, must own, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, it's you don't hear much about it. I I don't know if it just kind of like snuck under the radar. It didn't make much in the theaters. It basically made its budget back. Uh, people are weirdly talking about it now, and I wonder if people are finding it because of the actors that you know, everybody in this movie is famous. You know, like the mains. Yeah. I wonder if people are finding it because of the actors or, you know, this type of movie is more popular now. I don't know. But I've heard more about this movie recently than I have up until now. <laughs> like, uh, I've got, I've, some friends really love this movie. Well, it's movie. like the, about 25 years old, almost. So it's kind of hitting that yeah. iconic moment that like, you know, I don't think this is an iconic movie, but that 25 year people tend to look back at the, 25 the 30 the 30 is really popular now too yeah but i yeah i think this is this is one people are saying like oh this was pretty cool well i mean you know people your uh people your age who are like in their single digits probably watch this you know on cable when they shouldn't have or whatever yeah and now they're your age and they're like revisiting it right i think that's exactly what's happening yeah. with this because it was always on i can't stress enough how much yes. this was on hbo in the 90s <laughs> Yeah, and then after that, it just they just made, must have made a deal with. I can't, I really can't remember. If it, I think it was USA. I believe it would be yeah. USA. This seems like a USA movie back in the. Yeah, and then and then I always remember because I've seen Ruger Hauer so much in like Blind Fury that mm -hmm. was also on like the WB and they played that all the time. Yeah, I've seen so many Ruger Hauer movies just on syndication. Yeah, I think Ruger Hauer lives in syndication. Like, that's just where he lurks. <laughs> yeah, that's his penthouse. Yes, it's syndication. <laughs> All right, okay, let's uh, head off into the museum. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. This is the part of the show where we go out like Indy and we bring something back, good or bad. What are we putting in our museum, Matt? I think I know what you're going to put in the museum. So you're damn I'm right. not. I'm yeah. not going to put that in the museum. I'm going to just put. Uh, I'm going to put Charles S. Dutton's death in the museum because it is fucking awesome and hilarious. Good death. And like th this is this is when the makeup team came out to play because his scars are really gnarly and like. His legs are blown off, and they do that thing that I love when they do in like '90s movies, where like they just have like skin shreds just like yes, flapping yeah. in the wind. <laughs> it literally <laughs> looks like they it's like the skin turned into fabric. Like, yeah, it's and just it's like, just flopping around everywhere. <laughs> they did they did that a lot too in um, Saving Private Ryan yeah. in '98, like where people would be crawling on the beach Normandy like, yeah. when we stormed it. Yeah, that was a '90s thing. It was huge. I love it so yeah. big fan of it charles s dutton's death going in the museum it just i was i was hooting and hollering watching this thing by myself on a sunday afternoon <laughs> yes well mine is the whole place setting of the dinner but one specific story gary Busey. this is why i picked this movie i didn't remember that he was uh he was killed so quickly but i do remember his epic speech and it's it's perfect. It is Gary Busey being Busey. 
Yes, it is. He's doing animal noises. He's like just like he's expanding the story and giving you every gross detail. Yeah. It's it's wonderful. It's God, great. He does monologues so well. Yes. If we could control him, it would just be so great to give him all the monologues in every movie. But he is a wild card. <laughs> he's a, he's a hard one to nail down. <laughs> Got no idea what he's going to bring, but it's usually entertaining. <laughs> yes. Woo. All right, so we're going to move on on the Busey Christmas. I would, I would say at this point we have survived the game. We, we survived. <laughs> we survived week one of Busey, the very Busey Christmas. So this week I am gifting you a Busey. Okay. And so this you, is, this you are going to open it up, make sure everybody can hear it. Tremendously wrapped, may I yes. say. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, there we go. And the tape is... We're back with Gary Busey watching Predator 2. Woohoo! Who doesn't like Predator 2? <laughs> Almost everyone. <laughs> I am giving you this movie because we need to talk about this movie so that I can figure out what's going on in this movie. <laughs> so we're going to do something that no one has done before. Let's figure out Predator 2. Oh, there's a lot of information out there, so we got to get studying. Yes, we got to get to work here. Uh, or we can just be lazy. Whichever one. We'll get to like work for like a minute, and yeah. then we'll be like, okay. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. We're just going to stop here. This isn't fucking homework. <laughs> uh, so remember to rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, you can catch us on all the pod stuff. Podbean, iTunes, blah, blah, blah. Google Play. Um, and then uh, remember that if you email us at analogjonestof at gmail, a certain Matt is going to reply to you. Yes, I am. I still need to reply to Trucker, whatever his name is. Trucker Bill? Trucker Bill. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to. And uh, anybody else that wants to send their hate mail or love mail, I, I like both, uh, can send it that our way and I will respond to it. And there is a special reason why you should send your emails right now because January is going to be Listener's Month. Yes. We want to hear what you want to see, but you have to email us. Don't fucking put it on the Facebook. You have to email us. Don't message us either. Yes. <laughs> Damn it, email. Email us what you want us to do in January. Like a whole list so we can pick from it. So analogjonestof at gmail.com. And if you pick a VHS that we happen to own, <laughs> fingers crossed, uh, you might want to choose a new line because we probably should. <laughs> yeah. just, choose, just choose as many new lines as you can and we'll, we'll be good. <laughs> New Line or Warner Brothers? Yeah, those yeah. are our two that we have a lot of for some reason. But hey, fuck it. It's, what, right. we, it's what we like. <laughs> Until next week when we do Predator 2, remember to be kind. And rewind. Hey, do you guys like horror movies? I do. I do. Do they always have to be good movies? No way. I prefer them to be crap, personally. <laughs> well, then you guys are in luck because Horror Movie Night is your expert podcast on both horror movies, good, bad, and gooey. It's just a show of three friends. Brother. Yeah, two brothers and a friend, I, I think you would call. But we're also, we're all friends here. You know, we're friends. We we're all around. friends here. Yeah. We're friends. We goof around. But we <laughs> We talk about we talk about movies, but we normally don't actually talk about movies, which is kind of weird. It's, it's a weird <laughs> dynamic. You have to really listen to understand it. But we put together a show every Friday morning. You can find our show, hmnpodcast.com. Uh, we're part of the Geekscape Network. We are, you know, we're good guys. Just check us out. We're good, silly guys. We're, we're fun. Please like me. Please. <laughs> That's pretty Please. much the emphasis of everything we do is to be accepted. We want to yeah. be loved. HMMPodcast.com.